So thanks, everyone. My pleasure to be here. Uh, I was here last month, sort of just walked around and liked the, liked the vibe of the place, so I thought I should come back for an interview. All right, so I'm going to be telling you about some of the work I've done over the past five years at Cognell with my advisor, Thorsten Joachims. So in particular, I'm going to be talking a lot about uh, interactive learning systems. So interactive learning systems are part and parcel of our everyday life. For example, something like search engine like Google, right? We use it repeatedly, multiple times during the day. We interact with it, something like Netflix, for example, which we use for media and leisure. Again, something which is part and parcel of our entertainment uh, views, uh, entertainment needs. Going forward, things like smart homes, robotics, again, systems that require interaction between the human users of these systems and the actual underlying, the machine learning system behind it. So why is machine learning important for these systems? There are a bunch of different reasons. And perhaps the reason which I find most intriguing is knowledge accumulation. So let's take Netflix, right? So recommender systems like Netflix, they know a lot about the items in their, in their database. So Netflix, for example, knows that movies like Batman and Avengers are similar to each other. But it hasn't really watched these movies. It doesn't really have any specific annotations saying that these two movies are similar. But it has learned this. It has accumulated this knowledge via the interactions of you and me as users. So these things, again, like recommender systems are just one example. But again, the point here is that the knowledge which these systems are able to accumulate is, 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 is vast and very meaningful. And it's able to do so because of the machine learning uh, algorithms. It's uh, running underlying what we see on the user interfaces. But it goes beyond just this. So personalization is another big aspect of these interactive learning systems. If Netflix is able to figure out that, hey, Kartik, you like science fiction and action movies, so OK, I'm going to present you science fiction and action movies instead of presenting you rom-coms, for example. Right? I mean, that's something which is going to improve my user experience with this with this system is able to <clears throat> give me a more uh, more meaningful more apt set of recommendations and lastly i guess at the end of the day you want to have your system be the best it can you want to make the user experience as as great as possible and machine learning is the tool to do that right so let me tell you about how i think of this this interactive learning paradigm so the way I think of it is an interaction between these two parties. You have the system, the machine learning system. So let's say a search engine to, to ground it, for as an example. And you have the users of the system. And now these two are constantly interacting with each other, speaking with each other. So for example, a system is taking an action, such as presenting a ranking in the case of a search engine. And now the user is interacting with this ranking, viewing the results of this ranking and implicitly providing feedback via this interaction, say via clicks on the search results of the ranking. So what is sort of unique and critical to realize here is that we don't have these two, these two entities working on different tasks. They're working on the same task. They have the same goal in mind, which is to improve the overall user experience. So instead of having the system passively observe the user, why not have this tight coupling between these two? And the reasons for doing to, for tightly coupling these two entities together is they have perfectly complementary interests. So think of it this way. Your learning system is not something that has, it doesn't have world knowledge. It does not know, for example, that Batman and Avengers are similar to each other off the bat. But it's very powerful. It's able to perform a lot of complex computations. On the other hand, the human users, we can't perform a lot of computations, but we have a lot of world knowledge inside our head. Things that are absolutely trivial for us are highly non-trivial for machines, for example. We are able to do things like common sense reasoning, which again, hard task for a machine to do. So if we can get the best of both worlds, that would be the ideal scenario for creating this sort of nice learning system that, that can essentially run smoothly with, with minimal intervention from the, uh, from the system designers, for example. So again, the goal 
uh, of this talk is essentially to convince you that learning from this kind of user feedback, which is, 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 is a right way of going about learning these interactive learning systems. So the last thing I'll say before I get into the material is that interactive learning differs from traditional learning. And part, the key reason behind this is that the data which we get, the data which interactive learning systems have to learn from, is data that comes from users. This isn't a conventional label data. Instead, this data is something that is a result of the decisions made by human users when interacting with these systems. In other words, the data is really behavioral data, behavioral log data, which we're going to observe. So to be able to learn from this data, there are sort of three parts to the puzzle. The first part is your learning algorithm, which again, that, that, this is sort of the focus of your traditional machine learning, right? Come up with the best algorithm you can given the data, the learning problem that you have. And that's still true here. You want to come up with robust algorithms that can learn from this data that comes from users. But the, the story doesn't end here. So because we are dealing with these users, right? A second critical part of this puzzle is the user. We need to be able to interpret the actions of the user as feedback to be able to train our learning algorithms. We need to be able to put in place the motivations, the skills, the decision context which the user was faced with when they interacted with this system. So these are the first two parts. And I sort of, the, the, the third, the sort of, I would say the hidden, the key, the trump card really, is this notion of interventions. In the interactive learning system, this, the, the learning algorithm controls what the user sees at the end of the day. When I search for something on Google, Google has full freedom on what it presents me with. Same thing with Netflix, right? So the system can choose to intervene, can choose to alter the set of results presented to the user so that it's able to elicit feedback that is maximally beneficial for its own learning. So this, this sort of trump card, which allows us to improve learning with a minimal impact on user experience, is something which I believe is, is a critical element. And I'll try to convince you with a couple of examples during this talk. So again, I'm going to be talking about three different examples during this talk. Uh, where we had to think about this triple, this learning algorithm user intervention triple in a joint manner, essentially, and try to come up with a joint design space. So again, feel free to stop me if you have any questions. Uh, and I'll be happy to take any at any point of time. So yeah, was there? OK, no. Uh, so I'm going to be talking about three different examples of this triple. So let's start with the first one, which really is to uh, serves to highlight the impact and the importance of these interventions. So this was a problem we faced at Cognell a few years ago, uh, roughly the time which we started, which I started uh, my PhD. So Cognell hosts this digital library called Archive, which some of you may be familiar with. So Archive is a resource where people from different fields, computer science, physics, maths, uh, astrophysics, statistics, upload all of their, their papers so that other researchers around the world can see. And recently, earlier this year, Archive crossed about a million papers. So there's clearly a lot of data out there. There's clearly a lot of information. And we, therefore, we need tools to help us, to enable us, uh, enable the users of the system to be able to search and access this information more easily. So we wanted to build a search engine for this. So we said, OK, let's go out there. Let's download one of your standard, machine, standard search uh, software. Uh, whatever you want, Terrier, Lucene, you name it. Let's, let's try to like, build a system, deploy it on archive, and see how it does. So we went, we went and did that. And what we found is that the system did very, very, very poorly. And the reason behind it is that these systems are designed for things like web search ranking or for news ranking, whereas archive is a different beast for a bunch of different reasons. The papers here are very technical. You have a different, the, the, the queries which we get to see are very, very different. The intents are different. So essentially what we realized is that we needed a way to tune the parameters. We needed a way to learn the parameters of these algorithms, of these software, to be able to do a good job learning, uh, to be able to do a good job for ranking archive articles. So we said, OK, what do we do? We don't have the resources, the funding of Google or Microsoft to go out there and hire a bunch of annotators to annotate 
this document was relevant to this query, this document is not relevant. So we said, okay, why not we go ahead and actually just use this implicit feedback, the feedback we get from users, in particular the clicks. So for example, if I see a query, like in this case SVM, and I find that the user of this, who issued this query clicked on this result, I can now try to exploit this data to be able to learn a ranking function. But again, this is where it, it goes back to this sort of difference between interactive learning and traditional learning. Because for example, a click is not an indicator of relevance. It's not always an indicator of relevance. And there are a bunch of different reasons for this. There have been a lot of user studies over the past 10, 15 years studying this phenomena. And again, it goes back to a lot of factors. For one, users are noisy. You see noisy clicks all the time. But a bigger issue is the biases. So for example, one bias, which is very, very popularly studied in the web search, in the, in the search context, is this thing called position bias, where essentially the higher up I rank a document, the more likely it is to get a click, regardless of its relevance. Another kind of bias which is popularly studied is this thing called context bias, where something is influenced by the other documents surrounding it. So what do we do when the data we get is biased in this manner? It's biased of what the system is actually presenting. What kind of feedback can we infer to be able to learn from? So let's, let's, let's think this over again. So again, I have, say, a query SCM, and I see this ranking. Let's say I see click, clicks on these set of documents. So one of the most common things which, we can, uh, which people uh, have sort of studied and shown, makes sense, is that these, this, this click information essentially indicates a preference that the user would have preferred a ranking where these two click documents were placed above these two non-click documents. So in other words, if there was something clicked, I can place it above something that was not clicked, which is above it. I, but I can't say anything about things below it, just because the user may not have seen that information. So this is, some, this is a way of inferring a preference, saying that that ranking on the right is, is probably more preferable to the user than the ranking on the left. So okay, great, we have this. Let's, let's sort of try to generalize this principle. Let's try to think about it more broadly. So I'm gonna use a cartoony picture to illustrate this phenomena. Let's say we have this whole space of rankings and the system decided to present a user this ranking, uh, which I'll represent as Y. Now the user via the interaction is essentially implicitly performing some sort of exploration of the space. They're reading these articles. Essentially think of it as if they're reading different permutations of these, of these articles as well as other rankings. They may go ahead and do things like reformulations or uh, choose you suggested searches. A bunch of different uh, options are there to essentially explore the space of rankings. And via their feedback, they're essentially giving us a preference saying that, okay, hey, I would have preferred this other ranking, Y bar, over what you presented me. So what does this feedback mean? Again, it essentially is a preference between these two objects, Y bar and Y. But by no means does it tell us anything about what was potentially the best object, the Y star, the optimal ranking which I could have presented to the user. So again, let's maybe take a different example which is hopefully simpler to understand. Let's, let's take Netflix again, right? So uh, I like Netflix. What you said was pretty simple. Yeah. Oh, you like this? Okay. I don't think we need any more simple. Awesome, awesome, okay, good. Because Last time, uh, someone was like, oh, like I, I gave an audience non, to a non-technical audience, this talk, yeah, and they were like, thank you. Yeah, exactly, great, great. So the, the notion to describe are completely standard. Awesome, exactly. So this, is, this, this, is, this is perfectly makes sense, right? So for example, again, like the same ideas, not just in the rankings, Netflix, for example, the movies. All of these interactive learning systems essentially are a way to, like the feedback you get from users are essentially a way to induce preferences. So now, suppose I wanted to learn from this preference data. What kind of learning model can I use? So this is, this is the model which we came up with, and this is called the quart learning model. And I'm gonna describe this in, uh, in some detail uh, in the next couple of slides. So again, we had these two parties, the system and the user. The system is the search engine. And now every time the system gets a context, which I denote as X subscript T, which in, search, in the web search scenario is a query, the system takes an action, which was presenting a ranking to the user. Now, this, this, this object, this ranking Y, ha bears some utility for the user, which I denote as U. So each ranking, given the query, has some utility for the user, and you want to essentially maximize this utility. 
So what are reasonable feedback models for this? So in the coactive feedback model, which, which is a specific model which we came up with, we are essentially trying to learn from this preference, the Y bar of the user. And what we are essentially presuming, assuming, is the fact that the utility of this improved object, Y bar, is better than what was presented. So in other words, the utility of X comma Y bar is better than the utility of X comma Y. And how much better is characterized by this parameter alpha? So I'll, 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 I'll explain this notation in more detail in a couple of slides. But before I do that, I really want to think about what are other feedback models that people have used and exploited in the online learning literature for, for these kind of problems, these kind of learning problems. Yeah. yeah. So <clears throat> for the example you described earlier, it seems that given a YT, when a user clicks something, there's a whole class of things that you can say are preferred over mm -hmm. or shown, like a, any permutation as long as these things go up. Yeah. So is YT, is, YT bar, is that a single one or is that a class? It's, it's, so to keep it simple, it's a single one. You can definitely come up with, so there are conceivably many ways to come up with actually multiple ones and that could make your learning even more powerful. But the simplest case is actually one single Y bar returned to you, essentially, which you have inferred essentially from the user's actions as the feedback. So, okay, what are other learning models you can use? So, the, perhaps one of the first studied models was the full information model, where you not only, you ob essentially are observing the utility for every possible ranking. So, every possible ranking out there, you get the utility function. And now, this is clearly not reasonable, for example, in the, in the, in the search and archive search ranking scenario, right? I mean, this is, this is impossible to expect as feedback from the user. In fact, I'd go as far as saying that banded feedback, which is the other very popular form of feedback, is also unreasonable because there you need to be told a specific utility. I need to tell you that this ranking has a value 0.8 to me compared to this other ranking which has a value 0.5. Again, this is not something which is natural for users to provide via their interactions. Similarly, the optimal feedback, again, I think I've convinced you that this is, again, impossible to obtain. It's hard for the users to communicate. This is the perfect ranking. These are the set of documents that are the most relevant to me for this query. So given this, we're going to essentially, we essentially are going to try to learn from this kind of preference data, because that's the one which seems reasonable and realistic to do in this setting. So what yeah. about uh, relevance feedback or ranking SVMs, more, more pragmatic approaches, how does that compare to what you're learning? So, so all of those also typically are dealing with preference feedback in some way or the other. But the, most of those, for example, are typically supervised learning algorithms. I mean, there are a bunch of different... Uh, in what way is this not a supervised learning algorithm? Because, maybe let me, when I get to this, so how about this, like at the end of this, when I finish describing everything, I'll, we'll get back to your question. All right, so to start with, let's, so we, we sort of spoke of the learning algorithm side of things. Now let's talk more about the user. So in particular, what the user model is. So we're gonna assume that the users are behaving as per a linear utility model. So there exists some parameterization of your, of your documents, of your objects, phi, x, y, and there exists some W star out there by which the utility is a linear transformation of the feature space. This is, again, this is a simplified assumption, and uh, we'll, we'll try to address this in the next part, but bear with me for this part. So in, for example, in the ranking context, one way of obtaining this kind of parameterization, which is commonly done, is to use something like the NDCG kind of formulation, the discounted cumulative gain, where you take each of the documents in your ranking, you take each of the feature vectors for each of the documents, and weight them based on the position in which they were placed. So higher up the document is placed, the more weight it has. And so the weighting factors you see here are typically what you obtain via the NDCG uh, metric, which is one of the most common metrics used in the, in the web search and information retrieval context. Now, once you have these documents and you weight them, you essentially are gonna sum up all of their feature vectors to come up with the overall feature vector for ranking. And that, this, this basically gives you a parameterization of ranking in terms of the feature space. All right. So we have this uh, parameterization, we have the learning, we have the learning model. Let's, let's talk about the algorithm next. 
So in particular, we're going to be using a perceptron like algorithm. Because again, the way it works is that we want to have this constant interface between the users and the system. So let's say that we initialize a weight vector in, as in the perceptron algorithm to something, say uh, a random initialization. And now every single time we get a context, we get a query from the users, we are going to present the best ranking, the best y, based on our current estimate of the weight vector, based on our current estimate of the utility, essentially. Now, once we present this object, we're going to observe the feedback from the users. And you're going to construct feedback, as I showed in the earlier slides, by, say, putting the click documents above the non-click documents. And now we're going to update the model. So in other words, we're going to make a perceptron update where we're taking the feature vector of the feedback object, the feedback ranking, and subtracting out what is presented. So again, this is, this is essentially this very, very similar to the perceptron algorithm, with the exception that instead of using the optimal object, you're using the, the feedback object, or the feedback ranking that you, that you observed. OK, great. So this, this algorithm is a pretty simple algorithm, and it's essentially based, inspired by the perceptron algorithm, right? So the perceptron has some nice theoretical properties being studied over many years. What can we say about this one? So we went ahead analyzing the theoretical properties of this algorithm. And in particular, we analyzed the regret, which uh, is essentially the total suboptimality of an algorithm over its run, averaged over time. So OK. Now, to be able to say something meaningful about uh, the, the record of an algorithm, we need to say something about how the users are behaving, what kind of feedback we're getting. And this is where I'm going to use this alpha informativeness, the, which, I, which I showed in the earlier slides. So let me, just, let me sort of explain this with the cartoony picture. Say we have these two objects, y and y star. And again, these are sorted on a utility line. So let's say the distance and utility between them is, uh, is 1. All right? Uh, essentially, what alpha informativeness is saying is that the feedback object you're getting is bridging this gap between the two by alpha fraction. So if the distance between them was 1, then the, then the gap between y bar and y is now alpha times 1. So, but again, this is maybe a restrictive assumption to make. This may not exactly be uh, realistic to assume. So we say, okay, let's 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 try to allow for some violations of this. We're going to have some slack where you can potentially violate this 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 constraint and have things be less informative or more informative than this. And again, this also may seem to restrict this. So at the end of the day, what we said is, okay, in expectation we would like this condition to hold. In expectation, it should try to bridge the gap, uh, it should try to bridge alpha times the gap between the optimal and the presented object. And we would allow some slack. So the interesting thing to note here is that this is actually not an assumption. This is a characterization of any possible user feedback. So by appropriately setting the values of alpha and the slack variables, the size, I can essentially characterize any user feedback, any user, be any user behavior via uh, appropriate parameterization on these variables. All right, so again, it's the value of alpha is a critical one here because that is the one which is telling me how informative the feedback really is. With this, with this characterization of the feedback, I can now go ahead and say something about the regret of the algorithm. In particular, I can say that for any value of alpha and any linear utility function w star, the regret of the perceptron algorithm is bounded via this formula, via this bound. So if I wanted to understand this bound a little bit more, uh, I would first say that, hey, look, this is independent of the dimensionality of my feature parameterization of the space. So I can use a very rich representation, and it does not directly show up in the regret bound. The other thing, which is perhaps the more interesting thing, is the fact that the rate of convergence of the regret is essentially 1 by square root t, which is the same rate which you would get if you had the optimal feedback. If I therefore presented you the optimal object, I would get the same rate of regret 
with different constants, uh, essentially. So this is pretty interesting. Despite working with feedback that is, that is definitely subpar compared to the optimal feedback, I'm still able to get the same rate of convergence as what I would have got. So this was something which was very interesting to us as well. So we said, great, we have this algorithm. Let's go ahead. Let's, let's implement this on archive. This is going to solve all our problems. And that's what we did. So we ran a user study on archive where the goal was to learn a ranking function. And to measure how good the ranking function is, we used a couple of standard ways of testing it. In particular, we use this notion of interleaving, where I take two rankings, and essentially I, I juxtapose them with each other and try to see which one is better. So this is a very standard way of, of measuring performance in, in online tests for, uh, for search. So I'm looking at the ratio of how much better the al proposed algorithm is doing than the, than the baseline. And in particular, the baseline I used here was a, a, a fixed uh, hand-coded baseline, uh, which, which involved no learning. All right, so the higher the ratio, the better. And what we found is the following. So again, the higher, the better. And the x-axis shows the number of iterations. And what you'll find is that even after about 30,000 iterations of learning, the perceptron algorithm, which had nice theoretical bounds, is doing very poorly compared to this baseline algorithm, which had no learning going on. and was just essentially hand-tuned weights. So we asked ourselves, what's going wrong? Did, was there a bug in our code? We sort of went about checking it. Nope, no bugs in our code, really. Bug in the theory. We, we double-checked our theory, wrote down all our proofs again. Uh, nope, nothing wrong there either. So essentially what we realized is that we weren't, we weren't considering the intervention angles, the intervention uh, side of things. We had thought about the algorithm, we had thought about the user model, but we hadn't fully thought about the interventions. We hadn't optimized for interventions. So let me give you an example to, uh, uh, to illustrate one such uh, scenario. So let's say that I've, I've learned perfectly. Let's say I have learned a perfect model where I have the perfect WT, the perfect weight vector, and therefore I'm able to, pre <coughs> I'm able to predict the perfect, uh, the perfect ranking, Y star. So my prediction is exactly the same as the optimal. Now, if there was any noise in the user feedback, if the users did not click on exactly the right set of documents, I would essentially be getting a gradient which is pointing away from the optimal object, which is moving me away from this perfect weight vector. So again, what is going to happen is that I'll make some change, I'll update my weight vector, move it around a bit. But again, maybe I'll still be able to present the optimal object. But again, this phenomenon is going to keep repeating itself till at some point of time, I no longer am presenting this optimal object. I'm presenting something which is far worse than the optimal object. And then again, it becomes a question of, okay, I, I, go, I essentially keep learning again till I go back to the best ranking, but the same phenomenon is going to repeat itself. So, so can you go back to the previous slide? Yep. This one? Yeah, so where is this unstable oscillating behavior? It looks to me like it's very stable. It's just going down. Yeah, so the metric which we are seeing is partly responsible for that. So this metric doesn't fully capture the story. There are sort of other ways we went about analyzing it to see this. So for example, one thing you can do is that if I issue the same query, I can see how the weight vector essentially caused that document, where it caused the document to be ranked, for example. Right. And what you will see is that essentially is all, like essentially like an oscillating pattern, for example. But even if that's true, there are standard ways to deal with that by introducing some kind of temperature parameter or decay as you're getting more data. I assume the number of iterations means each point you got an additional data point. Yeah. So you can start to decay the impact of additional data points as you go, and then you get more stability. So that's very very similar to ideas like, for example, averaging. Averaging essentially the average perceptron does exactly that. And the problem is still won't be, it still is the same problem. Because again, think of it this way. When you are at a really good solution, there is no way for you to get any positive feedback. You can only get negative feedback. This is like, this is a very, very cartoony way of thinking. Like, this is one reason why this fails. There are a bunch of different reasons, but this is potentially the easiest one to explain in five minutes of a talk. Uh, 
But again, the, the fact of the matter is that things like regularization and averaging still do not allow you to get any more positive information, any positive feedback when you're nearing a good solution, when you're nearing, for example, the optimal solution. So do you have experiments to show that, or is that a theoretical claim? Experiments to show that. Okay. So uh, in particular, you may perhaps see in the next few slides what, like one, why this shows up, actually. So again, this was like one cartoony example. Let's, let's think of how we can actually fix this. So for example, instead of presenting the best object, if I presented something which is slightly subpar, say a little bit, a random perturbation, I randomly move in some direction away from this uh, W and choose, say, a Y tilde, which is a little bit worse than what uh, I was supposed to be predicting. And now I present this to the user. What this allows is that essentially I can get feedback in any, in all the, the feed, I get many more feedback rankings which would allow the user to essentially provide me a gradient which is still in the direction of the optimal object. So at a small cost of presenting something which is slightly suboptimal, I'm going to be able to get a gradient which is still an uh, unbiased gradient towards the optimal solution. So if I wanted to think about this in sort of a more uh, uh, principled manner, this is the notion of fair pairs, for example, which is, which is uh, how it's been uh, studied in the web search context. So where I take a ranking, I randomly swap adjacent pair, the first and second, third and fourth, fifth and sixth, with some independent probabilities. And this allows me essentially to handle the presentation biases. But at the same time, it helps me induce preferences between the different pairs of items. So we can essentially use, exploit this idea and take it to this, this perceptron-like algorithm and say, okay, hey, instead of presenting the best Y, I'm gonna present a slightly worse solution, which say I did by running flag pairs. And now I, I'm gonna repeat the same algorithm, but I'm gonna use the feedback of the flag pairs model, which is the pairwise feedback model. So again, this algorithm is, is very much similar to the previous algorithm, except that I'm doing this perturbation. And now, what is the impact of this perturbation? So from a theoretical standpoint, it actually does not hurt the algorithm anymore, really. Essentially, what I obtain is a regret bound that is almost identical to the previous one, where I have this one additional term at the end that is basically as, a, asymptotes to zero. It makes no impact in the long term. But the benefit I'm getting out of this algorithm is that I'm getting lower slack variables, which was the problem in the previous algorithm, where the slack variables I get were very, very high. So uh, at this is essentially a trade-off, a vanishing term for better slack variables. And now when we actually ran this, this algorithm on our graph, we essentially found that it's able to do far, far better. In fact, so my advisor is one of the uh, people who sort of came up with interleaving like about 10 years ago. And what he told me when he first saw this plot was that, hey, can you check this? Because he had never seen a win ratio which is this high. So, and we checked it and this was the case. So this is, this is very, very interesting to us that we were able to see such a big gap in the win ratio between the proposed algorithm and your baseline algorithm. And in fact, the story got even more interesting than this. So this was something which we did two years ago. Uh, this was the plot which we prepared for the ICML camera ready copy two years ago. And after this, we sort of moved on to other projects and forgot about this. Last year, one of the administrators, last year uh, around Christmas time, one of the administrators of Archive essentially mailed me, hey, there seems to be some experiment running on Archive for the last two years, what is this? And we realized that we had actually forgotten to switch this off after the camera ready copy. And we had no clue how it had done. And to a pleasant surprise, when I went back and looked at it, it actually kept learning. So uh, this, this, was, this was a pleasant surprise. This required zero intervention from my end. And this algorithm just kept learning. Uh, part of this, this plot is slightly deceiving because it may seem that this thing is actually plotting, this, this thing is actually, sorry, plateauing or converging. But that is, again, partly due to this metric of interleaving slash win ratio, which is 
not meant to actually study the difference between things which are so, so different in quality, so disparate in terms of quality. So again, this, the point of this was we are able to essentially come up with systems that require zero intervention and able to learn on the fly, on their own, by, by, by thinking about not just the algorithm and the user model, but also about the interventions, about how the algorithm can choose to, for example, say present something subpar, slightly subpar, just so that it's able to benefit its long-term learning. All right, so I think this is a good point to maybe take any questions. So Oren had a couple of questions during the uh, talk. So, so for example, things like rank SVM, right? Uh, the, some of the ideas, for example, are very common, as I said, the preferences, for example, that, that, that's, that's true. And people have tried to exploit and incorporate aspects like the perturbation. It, it doesn't actually, you use fair pairs or different variants to essentially try to make these algorithms more robust to get the preferences to be more robust. So in that way, it is, it's, it's essentially trying to take all of these ideas which we have collected over the last 10, 15 years and put it into a nice framework which we have some solid theory that we can talk about and at the same time, it's able to like work really well in practice. So it's essentially a different learning model, a different learning setting, but it's exploiting all of these ideas from rank SVM, fair pairs, interleaving, all of them essentially, and putting them into one, uh, one simple but clean algorithm. Did, did you actually do the comparison with uh, like ranked SVMs? Yes. So. Uh, yeah, I, I don't have the plot right here, but yes, we actually did that. Uh, yeah, yes, exactly. So part of the reason that this is an online algorithm, so you're able to learn much faster, you're able to adapt on the fly, that's part of the story behind it. So one of the earlier algorithms we were running actually on archive before my time, before I joined, was a rank SVM. Uh, that, that was essentially what was the baseline before I got here. Uh, and that again wasn't, what we found is a, a hand-tuned baseline was better than that. So uh, again, it's, there, there are a bunch of different reasons behind it, but part of the thing is that the, the kind of feedback we get on archive is very, very noisy, for example. Yes, Sashish. The uh, two parameters you had, the alpha and eta, uh, are they, do they actually show up in the algorithm? Or no, are they just they're just theoretical constructs. They're just used to argue about the theoretical, like how well the algorithm is doing in theory. That's, that's, so assuming the user behaves Exactly, exactly. It's essentially a way of parameterizing the user feedback. That, that's essentially what it is, yeah. So yeah, it doesn't show up in the algorithm at all. Uh, but if, for example, the information was present, there are actually ways of extending this algorithm like, to exploit that and make it better. But yeah, in general, the, the vanilla algorithm, for example, which we run did not use that. Um, so I got a little bit confused by the real world deployment. Uh -huh. So some users, unfortunately, got some really um, worse results. So we can run a better model. Right? You're presenting them. You're swapping the uh, the links. So it's not. Think of it this way. The worst they're seeing is that the the document that they really wanted to see was placed one position below. Yeah. So for example, the first document was placed in the second position. For example. So, so you can train the, be the better model. Right? Yes. Exactly. And how can you present users with better, you know, uh, results from a better model, from modern learning? I like the purpose of this is to give better. Oh, definitely. So, for example, think of it this way: you're essentially trading off short-term, uh, short-term loss for long-term gains. That's the idea. So, our goal is not just to present the best model to the best ranking to just this one user who's coming right now. It's to present rankings to the good rankings for all of the users, including the same user who's coming in in the future, for example. But when you present good rankings, your system stops the learning. So, according to your first model, right? Again, I I chose that example, like the, the the example of like learning towards the best solution, as a cartoony example. The problem, as I said, runs deeper than that. It's this instability is not just when you actually go towards the best ranking. This instability actually lies throughout because what happens is that. The problem is really a biased gradient. You, the gradient which you get if you do no perturbation is biased in directions that are suboptimal. So it's not just the case that I had to reach a best model to be able to learn something poorly. So the, I, I didn't talk about this, but this algorithm which I, the, the last algorithm which I had, you can actually choose to be smart about how you're doing the perturbations. And I, I didn't, the, the plot which I showed wasn't for that. 
but this algorithm can choose to minimize its perturbation as it gets more and more confident. And what that does is that towards the start, you're going to be making more exploration. You're going to be doing more perturbation just because you're unsure. But once you've learned enough, essentially, you don't need to perturb. You'll be, say, perturb once every 100 iterations only because you want to be certain, say, on that 100 iteration. 100 iteration. So it'll, once it's sort of got this buffer, this buffer of error where it's certain about, like, it's relatively certain saying, hey, I think I learned a good solution. My feedback seems to correspond well with what the users are saying as well. It, it no longer needs to be as aggressive about perturbation. So maybe that addresses your question? OK. Was that? No, OK. So are we doing for time? OK. So I'll be very quick about this part just because uh, I wasn't certain about how interesting this would be to folks. Uh, so part of, the, part of what I spoke in the earlier part was related to this notion of the utility model we have is a simple linear utility model. The theory behind that essentially assumed that there was a linear parameterization between the feature vector space and <coughs> the utility model. But in reality, users don't always have this sort of simple intent in mind. They behave in far more complex ways, right? So let's take an example. This is my uh, favorite example. So snow leopards, the animal, not the Mac operating system, uh, if I issue this query to say Bing, now the way I would uh, get results back uh, would be via the maximization of the relevance of results to this query, Snow Leopards. So for example, a perfectly viable set of results which I could get are say these, which are all talking about Snow Leopards, so they're relevant to the query. Now, what happens if I want to learn something more, if I want to get more nuanced information about this. So for example, say I want to learn things like what are the habitats of snow leopards or what are the lifespan of a snow leopard. Now the way I have to do this in the current learning, in the current search paradigm, web search paradigm, is that I need to issue multiple search queries. So what is the drawback of this? Well, the users are having to spend more time and effort. And this is something which is, which is not optimal. Again, a lot of user studies showing this that this, this effort, the, the time spent, is critical to essentially opt, keeping users satisfied and happy. So how could I have done better, for example? What could I have changed in this paradigm to be able to do a better job for these kind of complex tasks where I'm requiring more information? So the one thing I could have done is, instead of simply being reactive, simply reacting to a query being issued, I could have been proactive. I could have said, hey, let me not just maximize the relevance to the query which is currently issued, but also consider other potential future queries that would have been issued in the session, other potential future interests of this user. And this way I can look to essentially satisfy these users upfront by basically prefetching the right content for them. So how can I go about doing this? That, that's sort of like the goal of, that, that's sort of what we ask ourselves in this work. But before I get to that, let me convince you that this isn't exactly a toy problem I'm making up, just to say, get this idea across. This notion of complex tasks is actually a fairly important one. And that, this has been shown again by a lot of studies, most notably Peter Bailey at Bing, uh, essentially did a detailed log study of search, of search engine logs from Bing to show this. So, the Snow Leopard example is an example of something called information discovery and specific topics. And it turns out that about 14% of all user search sessions are of this form. And users tend to spend about 14 minutes of search time on these kind of sessions. Another very, very common kind of session which is sort of more nuanced is things like the comparison of different products or services, which again is about 12% of all searches that we actually observe in the search engine logs. Finding facts about typically celebrities, that's another very, very common uh, kind of session which we observe. So what is the notion that sort of crystallizes all of these different kinds of complex tasks? We came up with this notion called intrinsic diversity. So you may have heard of the term diversity in search, but that is a different diversity. The diversity we're talking about in, uh, in, the, in the traditional search setting is when I don't know what the intent of the user is. 
They issued the query Apple. I don't know if they meant Apple the fruit or Apple the company. On the other hand, in intrinsic diversity, it's the case that the users themselves want a diverse set of results. There is a need which is diverse intrinsically. I have, a, I have a intent, single intent in mind. Say, I want to learn about the animals, no leopards. But I'm interested in different aspects of this, in, of this information need, like the habitat, the lifespan, different aspects of the single information need. So what happens is that because traditional diversification methods work at a different level of diversification, which is the user intent, they're not well suited for this task. And that's what motivated us to study this problem more deeply. Uh, so, essentially what, so our work was really the first work which studied this problem uh, in any detail. And we studied it in particular in the notion of uh, web search. We also did it in a recommendation setting in a, in a subsequent work. But what we sort of did during this work was sort of a threefold approach to this problem, like an end-to-end -end approach. So in the first part of it, we said, okay, how do I go about identifying these sessions? If I have an intrinsically diverse session, how do I go about identifying it from a search engine log? So this, this involved analyzing the sort of behavioral data of the logs. A second aspect was, okay, hey, given uh, these sessions, now can I train models to be able to help me identify when a session is an intrinsically diverse session? In particular, if, can I predict that a query, say Snow Leopards, is gonna start an intrinsically diverse session? And lastly, given a query which is actually starting an intrinsically reverse session, what can I do better? Can I improve the ranking performance of, of the search engine algorithm to help me essentially maximize not just the relevance of this query, but this notion of whole session relevance? So I'll, I'll essentially, so this, is, this was a very detailed set of works. I'll try to skip details just for the interest of time, but maybe share a couple of interesting findings from this work. So for example, one of the things which we found about the queries that start intrinsically diverse sessions was, thing, was something like, was list-like nouns, for example, the prominence of list-like nouns. Things like forms, facts, types, ideas. These words tend to occur far more frequently in intrinsically diverse queries than, non, than your standard regular queries. Broad terms like information, manual, Again, very, 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 very pronounced in these kind of queries compared to your regular search queries. We also found question words, queries that start typically with what, why, who, where, for example, were, were a good indication of something being intrinsically diverse versus uh, uh, not. Similarly, the, 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 <coughs> the presence of, of proper nouns, typically celebrating names, that was again a very, very good indication. So are you, are you looking at and annotated queries to say which ones are intrinsically diverse and which ones are not? Yeah, okay. so in particular, it's the queries that are starting an intrinsically diverse session. Okay. So if I look at queries that are a regular session, that are starting a regular session, or I mean, are a part of a regular session versus queries that are starting an intrinsically diverse session, we essentially looked at the log odds of the prominence of different features between these two classes. And how do you tell us an intrinsically diverse session? Are you just looking at the things the users clicked on and saying, <coughs> These cover lots of topics. So yeah, we had a different. We had sort of uh, annotation guidelines which required people looking at the queries, the the terms in those queries. Uh, yeah. All right. So this was something which was pretty interesting. Like, for example, the prominence of plural nouns compared to singular nouns. All of this, which could sort of like post hoc help us understand the stars better. Uh, but let me move on to the ranking part of it. I'll actually just. Maybe I'll just breeze through this. So we had the goal of essentially not just maximizing the relevance to your current query, but sort of predicting future queries and maximizing relevance to those future queries. So if I want to sort of think about it uh, from a theoretical standpoint, if I give you a query queue, my goal was not only to sort of produce a ranking of the documents, D1, D2, so on, so forth, but also think of the future queries that may be issued with this, with this, uh, in this session, which I'll denote as Q1, Q2, and so on and so forth. And we sort of asked ourselves, what are the desirable properties we want a ranking algorithm to have? 
So the ranking algorithm should not only satisfy the current query, but the future queries. And that means the documents I choose should be relevant to my current query and a potential future query. But it's also important that we not only focus on, like, say, one aspect. So we want the aspects we choose, the, the, the future queries we use, to be relevant to this current query, to be something which is feasible that the, 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 that the algorithm is going to actually, that the user is actually going to issue in the future. So this can basically be thought of as if, uh, by, by the notion that the diverse, the aspects should be diverse amongst themselves. So again, I had this picture earlier where I spoke about the utility model, the simple linear utility model. In this case, it no longer is as simple as that. I still have these, these position factors involving uh, the, the discounting, where the, the higher up the document is, the more impact it has on the utility. I still have that, but I no longer have just a single query. I have different, these, this, this notion of the future queries as well, which I have to consider in my utility model. And I have to consider how I'm going to actually in, like, aggregate these different utilities. So in the previous case, I was simply summing them up. But again, this is not considering the relationships between the different documents. So if I present only documents about one single aspect, that isn't really ideal because those, I, I'm not considering the diversity aspect of things. So one way of doing this is to essentially have a function that has diminishing returns for diversity, uh, which is basically submodularity, uh, if for those of you who are familiar with that. So again, we have this complicated utility function that aggregates all of these different queries and documents together by considering the relationship, relationships between the different documents uh, and, and arguing uh, in terms of these relationships. So again, I, I, I sort of spoil, gave a spoiler up ahead that this is this notion of submodularity. So for those of you who are not familiar with submodularity, submodularity basically says that the marginal benefit of having an additional item diminishes as my set grows. So for example, the value of, of adding the circle D1 to my chosen set of circles is lower given the fact that say D4 was already added to my set. And again, this is a very general notion, but the cool thing about submodularity is that it has again, nice, nice theoretical properties behind it. In particular, you can say that a simple algorithm, like a greedy algorithm, which picks the item with the highest marginal benefit, has <coughs> a constant factor approximation. And again, this allows you to sort of go about showing nice theoretical set of results. So we essentially took this algorithm, we essentially took these ideas and actually implemented this by extending the previous algorithms, albeit this was in a supervised setting. And we actually ran this on Bing data, where we actually compared the performance of, our, of, of this proposed algorithm to the underlying Bing, Bing search engine ranker. So we, we used, our baseline was something called a relevance baseline, which was the function that we were able to train. Because the Bing ranker in particular uses more functions than just this relevance ranker, which we did not have access to. So that ranker does almost the same as what the uh, commercial ranker does. It's about 97% of the performance. But the proposed method is essentially able to improve upon the existing performance for these queries by about 10 to 15%. And we had a way to essentially take these ideas and incorporate interactivity as well, which would boost performance even further by about 30 to 40 percent. So the key idea here really was that we should, again, utility users are not always very simple. They don't always behave, say, in a linear fashion. But if we consider the interactions, if we consider the relationships between different items of, for example, a search engine ranking, we're able to model these relationships better and come up with better learning functions. And this can be in a different set, of, like in different paradigms. So the previous study was in a supervised learning to rank setting, but we can do better. So for example, I mean, we can do, not better, we can do this in alternate settings as well. So we did this in a co-actor learning setting for a, for a recommendation system, for example, 
where we essentially showed that modeling the dependencies, which is the red line, was able to be better than something which did not consider the dependencies, which is the green line. And we did this for not only your intrinsic diversity problem, but for, say, the generic diversity problem, and essentially came up with the first algorithms to learn from user feedback for this problem. Because the traditional algorithms we had there were all reliant on having supervised data for this, but we, able, we, used, we essentially proposed an algorithm that was able to learn from implicit feedback, basically. So, I don't know, at this point in time, maybe I want to say, are there any questions or, how oh, are we doing for time? I, the last part is, uh, is about peer grading. I don't know how interesting that is to folks, but. Uh, uh, yeah, so we have about two minutes, so maybe. Yeah, so I guess what I'll do is I'll just, let me just move this. So, oh, sorry. Sorry, yeah. <clears throat> I tried a bunch of new things in this talk. I got tired of giving the old talks. So I introduced a bunch of new slides uh, and new. I don't talk about some of these things, but I said, let me talk about them. All right. So, essentially, a common theme in the, in this <coughs> in the in the problems which I've studied is the fact that your data comes from users, and you want algorithms that have nice theoretical properties, but work well in practice. And when I say work well in practice, I mean things like they have few parameters. You're able to learn them robustly. They run fast. So again, robustness is the key aspect of this because you have to be able to you have to be able to account for noise and biases in the user data in, in the user feedback data. Typically, you also have to account for things like model misspecification. So, for example, in the archive search engine setting, right? It isn't the case that the users of archive really behave as per some linear utility function. I don't I don't believe that to be the case. But we want an algorithm that is able to still learn as good a linear function as it can that approximates their behavior. <clears throat> and <clears throat> sorry, I typically like to work in an end-to-end -end setting where starting from scratch, I like to come up with problems, uh, uh, sub-problems that I can solve and argue about the theoretical properties and eventually run this on a user-facing system. So again, if there's one takeaway from this talk, it's to think about these, this, this tuple when you're working in an interactive learning problem. So some of the takeaways which we realized was that when you come up with learning algorithms in these problems, it's usually, it's usually helpful to come up with algorithms that work with preferences and learn from preferences rather than learn from uh, your sort of scalar values, for instance. It's important to be able to think of how the users are behaving. And tools like rational choice theory from, from behavioral economics uh, or behavioral sociology like uh, tools uh, <clears throat> help us I, do so by converting the goals of the users to actions, meaningful actions. And lastly, we have this notion of intervention where we can essentially exploit exploration of both ends, the user and the system side of things. And by sharing exploration, we can have them do better. But again, I, this, this notion of interventions is still very, very new and like very under, understudied. And I think there are a lot of interesting problems out there regarding this, this notion of interventions. So with that, maybe I'll tell you like one last slide, which is something that, that I sort of switched focus to about a year ago and is, is, is drives me and sort of has me interested. So it's this notion of knowledge, which I, which I sort of started with like how Netflix is able to capture all of the different relationships, right? all the knowledge by exploiting the, the data, which the behavioral data which we get. I want to generalize this principle because the way I think of it is that we have three, like this sort of holy, holy grail or this, this triumvirate of knowledge where we have this factual world knowledge where things on Wikipedia, for example, facts. Uh, which we have, which we have studied and we know how to represent and capture at least uh, to some extent. But we, on the other hand, we have this behavioral knowledge, knowledge that is implicit inside our head that isn't so well formed, for example. Like, again, the relationships between Batman and Avengers, for example, as movies, right? These aren't exactly things that are, I can say, are facts. They're more, say, like similarities, for instance. 
Uh, but again, this could be more broad. And the question is, how do you actually go about learning this knowledge and capturing this knowledge? What are the right representations to use? So in particular, I have been looking to study, uh, I've been looking at embedding models to be able to embed different relationships between items, uh, different kinds of items, different modalities of items, and capture the relationships between them. And based on some of the things we have done in archive, this actually seems like a very promising notion to go ahead with. And what I sort of see as being an interesting logical next step for this is to be able to combine these different sources of knowledge to be able to do more powerful reasoning and eventually take on tasks like common sense reasoning, for example. But yeah, I'm happy to talk more about this with any of you all afterwards. Or I'm here, I think I'm here for the next 15 minutes also. So I think with that, I'll stop and take any questions you may have. Thanks. Thank you.